Um, the speaker today for the whole okra is Chris Smith. Uh, he is the exec executive director of the Utopian Seed Project, a crop trialing nonprofit working to celebrate food and farming. Within this work, he collaborates on the Heirloom Collard Project, hosts a seasonal trial to table event series, and publishes Crop Stories, a crop specific multimedia project. His book, The Whole Okra, which I think is right here. <laughs> Um, won the James Beard Foundation Award in 2020, and he is the co-host of the Okra Podcast. In 2023, he received the Organic Educator Award from the Organic Grower School and was named a champion of conservation by Garden and Gun. So, welcome, Chris. Okay, um, Okra. Um, how many people have grown okra cool okay um so the way i'm thinking about this presentation is i've got uh it's almost in two halves it's got like half growing which we'll we'll go through because there's some interesting stuff in there but uh we'll like not get too caught up on the basics um and then the other half is kind of like the whole okra in terms of eating and using the whole plant which has a, a lot of fun stuff in it that I hope um, will continue to inspire your okra growing journeys. Um, so that's kind of like the way the way the presentation goes, and I'll. It, it's become problematic me talking about okra because I just keep keep just falling down the rabbit hole of okra, and there is just so so much out there, and and so to try and just talk for an hour about okra. Um, is becoming more and more challenging. So I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and keep it short enough that we can have some questions. But I am also around for the rest of the day. So if things come up, then I'm happy to like be cornered and, and chat about anything okra or the climate resilient gardening type concept. Um, okay. So um, I grew up in England, where we don't grow okra. So I don't have like a long history with okra. It's like being a very short, passionate love affair. Um, so I, I came to America in 2012, moved to Greenville, South Carolina, and then Asheville, North Carolina shortly after. And I was really excited to be here. I grew up in like a gardening family where my mom was a big backyard home grower type person. And my brother's like a horticulturist and has a big nursery and goes to Royal Horticultural Society shows. So kind of like, I didn't necessarily embrace it as a child, but I, I kind of had those green thumbs in my DNA. And, and so when I came to America and had the opportunity to plant a garden, I was, I was one, very excited about that. But two, there was like so many things I could grow here that I couldn't grow back home. And I would, I remember phoning up my mom and saying, you know, I can grow peanuts, I can grow sweet potatoes, I can grow tomatoes without a greenhouse, I can grow peppers in just the open garden. Uh, there's this thing called okra that I've never heard of, but sounds cool. Um, and um, so there's all, all these types of things that um, I was excited about growing. And I, I planted my first home garden with all of those things, like just did the whole like over the top gardener, I'm going to grow everything thing and it didn't take too long to realize that while the south has these like perfect growing conditions in terms of weather it's also got the perfect conditions for like every single pest and pathogen that seems to exist in the world and so you know the cucurbits were just like downy mildew and powdery mildew and vine borers like they're evil little things and then you know all the the blights on the tomatoes and the potatoes and uh you know fool be you if you try and grow brassicas during the summer without cover because you know cabbage worms and harlequin beetles and basically this like this beautiful garden that i'd begun the season boasting to my family back home about was just like slowly decimated and even the mammals right you've got we don't have possums we don't have raccoons groundhogs even your deer seem more aggressive than the average english deer there's like a woodland creature thing in England where there's like a level of politeness and respect that does not exist in America. Um, so like just literally everything was devastating from the garden. Apart from the okra, the, the, it was like, just like, it was my single shining glory in that first year that I had that garden. And just by total chance, I'd planted the okra 
we had like kind of like a, a second story balcony and I planted the okra next to that balcony. And by the end of the season, it was like 14 feet tall and I had to be on the balcony to be harvesting the okra. And it just like in that first year, it just one because of its sheer survivability, but also level of production, but also beauty. Okra is such a, like a beautiful plant. It's, you know, obviously related to hibiscus and just got those beautiful flowers and foliage and, and red stems. And, and yeah, it just really enamored me in that first year and, and produced a whole lot of food. So that was kind of like my okra beginning. And I was working for a small seed company in Asheville at the time, So True Seed. And as part of that work, I'd go to a lot of agricultural conferences and speak to folks about gardening. And I remember like just enthusiastically telling everyone about like okra and being like, oh, oh my God, okra is so amazing. It's so good. I didn't know much about okra and just getting very excited about okra. And at least half the people I spoke to were just like, okra, it's, it's yuck, it's slimy. It's horrible. Like, why would you ever like okra? Um, and I got, I just like, I got all this pushback. And I was like, this, I was living in this weird parallel world where I was like, this plant is amazing. And I think it's awesome. And I want to know everything about it. And half the population is telling me that it's the worst thing in the world. Um, so I, you know, that's some identity issues. And uh, I worked them through and just basically began researching a lot, a lot about okra. And so some of the research I found was not good. Um, Tom Caliccio, celebrity chef, you know, he does um, top shelf chef and all that sort of stuff. He's publicly said, I hate okra and grated yam for the same reason. They're both slimy. So like high level chef, so you think should be able to appreciate good food. It does not like okra. Did you have a question? Or oh, you were just throwing your hands up in disapproval? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, Julia Reed is a Southern writer who actually apparently likes okra, but she wrote this publicly. So few people eat okra, more radishes are grown in this country that it never even makes it onto the lists of the top 10 most hated foods. I mean, that's a low blow. It's like so bad, it doesn't even make it onto bad food lists. So I came across that one. And then this one kind of stings the most. Um, Robin Williams said, okra is the closest thing to nylon I've ever tasted. It's like cotton. It's like they bred cotton with a green bean. Okra tastes more like snot. The more you cook it, the more it turns into string. So um, the one thing we can say about this quote is that botanically he was kind of close because you know co cotton is related to okra. It's in the same family, Malvaceae, but everything else is just disappointing. Um, so um, so th this was the type. I mean, these are famous people saying this, but this is like. I would come up against this all the time um, and, and be very saddened by those reactions. Um, but there is a whole alternate narrative. Uh, this is a quote from Lost Crops of Africa about okra, uh, which can actually, it's a, if you've not come across this Lost Crops series, they're available online as a PDF download, and they do deep dives into uh, traditional crops. Uh, there's a Lost Crops of the Incas and a Lost Crops of Africa, which is split into three different volumes. Definitely worth checking out. But about okra, they said, in reality, okra could have a future that will make people puzzle over why earlier generations failed to seize the opportunity before their eyes. In the botanical kingdom, it may actually be a Cinderella, though still living on the hearth of neglect amid the ashes of scorn. So I guess part of what I feel compelled to do is make people see the Cinderella in, in okra. Um, and, and that's what we're going to jump into. OK, so okra, um, botanically, you can, you can see why I never experienced okra. There's little old England, which has um, zero okra production. Um, and, and actually, most of Europe, we don't see a lot of okra. Uh, although folks in kind of Mediterranean Europe have reached out to me in recent years. So like Spain is beginning some okra production and that kind of thing. But uh, historically, okra has kind of like two origin stories. There's solid evidence that it started off as kind of like a, uh, a selection of a wild cultivar in East Africa, kind of Ethiopia region, but there's also a lot of wild crop rel relatives in um, kind of Southeast Asia, Northeast India, that type of region. Um, so no one's definitively been up, pinned down like where okra actually began, 
but we know that it's got deep cultural connections to both Africa and uh, India slash Asia. Uh, we do know how it got to the Americas. Uh, okra uh, migrated from that Eastern Africa across to West Africa, strong okra culture in West Africa. Um, and then with the transatlantic slave trade, then a lot of African origin crops were brought across to the Americas. Okra was one of them, likely landed in the ports of Charleston or Louisiana, um, New Orleans, sorry, uh, at some time, 1500s, and then made its way into North America. So definitely a food that came to the Americas with deep African culture. And, and we see that even in you know, dishes like gumbo and some traditional African languages, go, uh, okra is known as ki gumbo. So there's very solid connections um, from West African food culture and cuisine into the way okra is used in North America. And then the obvious assimilations that foods go through when they end up in new places. Um, okay, so, uh, oh, one thing I did want to say about that. The, the thing you, you'll notice strongly about this is that the okra growing regions, it's uh, are right through the middle, right? So okra is a heat loving plant and is tropical, semi-tropical in, in origin and, and really thrives in those hot conditions. So that's something to keep in the back of our heads as we're trying to grow okra not necessarily a fan of like northern american growing conditions it, it does well in the south i was looking at your growing conditions and actually it seems like we're not too dissimilar i i live further south than you obviously but i'm at elevation in the mountains and that seems to be we you may even have a longer growing season than i do um and it's that and i found pl plenty of evidence that you can grow over here so that's that's good um but yeah, much further north, and it's, it's not that happy. And, and last year, we got a cool start to the season. Our June was very cold. Okra very unhappy with that situation. Oh, yeah, people ask that. Sorry. It's, it's, it's one of those silly maps where, like, okra is grown in North America. Therefore, every part of North America is highlighted. It's not grown in Alaska. OK, so there's, there's just a couple of things that, like, kind of or random gardening tangents that I think you might find interesting or maybe useful if you've not grown okra before. In general, okra is quite easy to grow if you've got like those like basic heat requirements. Uh, but some people stumble across germination issues with okra, so I like to address that. I, I think this is kind of a, an interesting chart where we can see um, the temperature of the soil at germination affects both the germination percentage, like how many seeds come up, but also the time it takes them to come up. And the longer the seeds are in the soil and not germinating, the more likely they're going to be dug up and eaten by a mouse or rot out because the soil is a little bit too wet and those types of things. So if you've got seeds sitting in cool soil, even though they might eventually germinate, you know, 59 Fahrenheit, we can still have a high germination rate of 74% but it takes 27 days for them to actually germinate at that soil temperature. That's, 20, that's a month where those seeds could fall foul of any number of things. So um, planting too early is definitely a problem. You know, gardeners get very excited in the spring and start sowing okra in mid-April. You're less likely to have good germination rates and success than if you were to wait until those soils had warmed up at, at least into the 70s where we can see more rapid germination and actually, you know, the, the highest rates of germination in terms of speed days to emerge is in the eighties and the nineties. Um, and then it can be too hot. So 104 Fahrenheit there, and we're seeing 35% germination. So uh, be aware of that, but that's sweet 80, 80 Fahrenheit soil temperature. That's actually really warm. And I think most of us direct seeding okra are probably not waiting for it to get that warm. Um, so just, just something to be aware of. This is also not all seeds are created equal. So all varieties, not all varieties will react like this. He did this one test on this one variety of okra and I don't even know what variety it was. So there has been work to do you know, quicker emerging okra. You can make selections for early germination, early vigor. That's kind of be part of your own seed saving work um, to ch change these numbers a little bit. But 
space, baseline rule, okra likes it warm. Uh, big question that came up as I was researching this book, um, or not even a question really, like everyone likes to tell you what they know about okra. Um, so lots of people had all these different ways like to treat okra seeds before they would plant them. And it got to a point, this isn't even all of the ones that people told me, but it, it got to a point where I was like, everyone was telling me that this was the, they, this was the only thing they did to, to grow okra. Uh, and you know, the bleaching, the soaking, cold water, hot soak, some people froze them overnight, some people nicked them with nail clippers for you know, natural scarification. Uh, so just lots of different treatment methods on okra seeds. And everybody that told me that they did this one thing swore like on their lives that this was what you had to do to grow okra. Um, and so after like the 10th person had told me that this is the only way you can grow okra, I was like, you can't all be right. And so I, I took all those different methods and just did a, a very basic on my kitchen counter germination test with each of those different treatments. And, and my takeaway from this, uh, and you may interpret it differently, is that it didn't really matter. Um, th there was, you know, the fastest was 12 hours, the slowest was 48 hours. That's not a massive difference in germination time for all these different things. Um, and it's kind of, I, I learned this a long time ago working at this seed company. We, we used to field a lot of gardener questions is, you know, I think it's part of the beauty of gardening is that there's so many ways to do something um, and most of them are successful. The, the trap that we fall into as egotistical humans is that because something works for me, then that is the only way to do something. Um, and so lots of different ways and most of them work most of the time. And, and that's generally what I found from this. Um, I, th things I would pull out from this is personally, I do soak my seeds overnight generally um, because you know it's passive, it's easy, and it does speed up germination. So why wouldn't I? Um, occasionally, I will bleach my seeds. I generally don't like using chemicals in agriculture, but I have read some compelling papers on using bleach. One, it improves germination in terms of you know, that scarification, but two, it has a side effect of killing any pathogens that might be transmitted on the seeds. So if you're, if you're concerned about where your seeds came from, or you had some disease issues on your okra last year and you saved the seeds and you were worried that that might be a seed borne disease, then bleaching those seeds can be a way to like stop that um, vector of that pathogen continuing. When you say bleach, I'm assuming it's a bleach solution. You, sorry, you're, you're right, 10% 10, 10 generally, 10%, uh, yeah, yeah, good. Clarification. Everyone's just got dissolved okra seeds. Yeah. Yeah, 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 similar, similar, yeah. Okay. Uh, another question that comes up, uh, transplanting versus direct seeding. Can we take a poll of the room? Who transplants okra? Who direct seeds okra? I've got both hands up because I do both. Is that why you got both hands up? Okay, yeah. Um, so um, I'm a bit of I'm a lazy gardener, so I, I, like I generally will direct seed whenever I can because it's easier. Um, I will obviously some things need transplanting. You know, we transplant tomatoes, peppers, all those longer seasons, summer annuals. Um, okra, I was always like ah, I, I'm kind of in in the middle on it. Uh, some interesting things that I got to was plenty of farmers told me that they like religiously transplant okra because it's the only way for them to get okra to market by July. Uh, so if you start your okra seeds indoors in ideal conditions four to six weeks ahead of transplanting, you can be tran you know you can get those warm soil conditions for quick germination on heat mats, transplant out after danger of frost, like when nighttime temperatures are above 50 Fahrenheit, for us, that's around about mid-May, and we can be getting them in the field, and then we still got that kind of like 50-day window for growing and flowering, and hit July, end of June sometimes, and we can be having okra at market. So that's a very compelling reason. If, you, if, you, if you're on a market schedule or you, you just can't wait for okra, which is often the case, then, um, then transplanting will get you okra quicker, um, there was a really interesting 
uh, it wasn't even really a study. It was more just like a side-by-side -side comparison that Seed Savers Exchange did one year where they generally transplant because they've got a fairly short window. So they're worried about getting seed production in that window. Uh, but they decided to um, transplant half of their varieties and then the other, sorry, not variety. They like split their plantings in half and half of it they direct seeded and half of it they transplanted. And it got like into the summer and they were both growing pretty much the same. They were like, you know, they kind of the direct seeded ones caught up with the transplanted ones and there wasn't a huge difference there. But then they had like a summer storm blow through and every single transplanted okra lodged and fell over and every single direct seeded okra stayed standing. And I thought that was one compelling given our erratic weather conditions uh, and just two su super interesting that um, direct seeded plants, we could assume develop a, a better root system. And then there's additional benefits of that, right? It's not just uh, an anchor, the roots are more than that. They, If the roots go deeper, they have access to more nutrients, they have access to better water, so they're likely to be more drought tolerant on, on all these types of things. So that's a, it's a pretty solid, um, support for, for direct seeding okra is you potentially get healthier plants. Um, okay. So to explore that root thing a bit deeper, then um, this was done a long time ago. This is, um, this is a cool book. Oh yeah, Root Development of Vegetable Crops. This is like old enough that it's open archive, so you can go and look it up. And they did all these crazy, like they would plant these crops and then dig them up and brush them off and document the root development. And so this is this is okra, and you can see this picture on my left, your left, um, is just, um, this is the young one. This is three weeks in. So it's three weeks after planting the okra, it already had a, a foot and a half taproot, but even more interesting was this, like, this deep, you know, kind of six inches of lateral root development, 18 inches in all directions. So that's kind of like all, like, that's all root development if there's nothing impeding it with real dense lateral roots. So, and that's just three weeks in, so real dense network. And then at the mature plant, this eight week one, which is the one on the right, each of these blocks is a one foot block. So you're now seeing like a five foot spread of roots. And that's like my eighth index is about five tenths. So it's about this much all the way around of lateral root development. And then it's saying it had a four and a half foot tap root, which is, you know, knees, knees to the floor. So if my head was the okra stalk, then like I'm the root right now. And that's like a lot of roots. And it speaks to why okra is extremely drought tolerant and extremely good at being able to mine nutrients from parts of the soil. Um, they, in, in industrial settings, they often plant okra as a kind of a scavenger secondary crop. So they'll do a high high commodity crop with lots of fertilizers on it, and then they'll follow it with okra, which is able to scavenge the nutrients but not need a lot of inputs itself. So really impressive root system. Um, it led me to kind of ask, like, given that root system is so expansive, can you grow okra in containers? My, and actually I planted this variety called Little Egypt that generally gets about two feet tall. It's one of my dwarf varieties. Uh, and the answer was you can grow okra in containers, but okra can't be contained. Um, what, what, I, what I'd done was I'd taken a five gallon bucket, um, filled it with soil, had some drainage holes in the bottom, planted my one plant in it, just one plant to see what happened. And it, it grew, this is, this is the plant from that bucket um, that was, you know, produced pods and all that sort of stuff, not necessarily high yielding, but again, I'm a lazy gardener, so I probably didn't water it or do anything I was meant to do with it. But it was just sitting in my garden and at the end of the season, what I thought I'd do, I'd be like, the cool thing about growing in a bucket is I can move the bucket and put it in my greenhouse. And then, I'll, can, can you hear me? I'm not even speaking to the microphone. Okay. Um, uh, the cool thing is I, um, yeah, put it in the greenhouse. It will continue to produce season extension. Uh, but when I tried to move the bucket, it was like cemented to the ground and I literally couldn't move the bucket. And after I went and got a shovel and kind of dug out the bucket. And you can kind of see it in, in this, do I have a pointer? <laughs> um, you can kind of see it here. This is this is the okra root. It hit one of my drainage holes. It kind of went narrow. 
that on the other side of it it grew back and and then went into the ground and then continued to grow into the ground. So the whole the whole thing had just like it bust out the bucket into the ground and, and continued to grow and was just like solid. So um so those roots again are just really impressive and, and part of what gives okra it's it's good agronomic qualities in being a, a low input, high yielding crop in the field. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on harvesting and maintenance because um, a lot of you are growing it. Um, in terms of seed selection and and seed growing, I, I have personal preferences. Um, but I feel like they're so subjective. I've spoken to lots of different people growing in lots of different environments. Like some, some okra has like lots and lots of branches. And you get all these branches coming out. And there was a guy uh, called Ron Cook who grew clamps and spineless and noticed a few of his plants were putting on more branches than other plants. And each of those side branches were then flowering and producing pods. And so he was getting high yields off that plant. And he selected safe seeds from those ones that were more branching. And he did this for... I think 10, 15 years, maybe more, and eventually called that variety Heavy Hitter. And you can buy that seed today. So there's a variety called Heavy Hitter. And it, he was just always selecting for like the, the bushiest plants. And he now gets like trunks, okra trunks like this big around with like side branches that are just, if he grows it not close to other plants, it can have like an eight foot spread in all directions with heavy branching and each plant just produces insane amounts of okra, which is fantastic. But if you, when you put that into kind of like a 12 to 18 inch standard row spacing system, then it, it, it doesn't produce that much okra, but it's still really branchy and bushy and is actually an epic pain to harvest. Like I, it, when, when I harvest fields of okra, I want like one stalk, I want the okra close to the branch so that I can go down and just clip, 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 and get lots of okra in one go. With the heavy hitter, it's a beautiful, impressive plant, a real testimony to selection. Home gardeners, I would encourage you to grow it all the time, but you've got to like go hunting for it. You've got to like walk half a mile around the plant just to get to the other side to harvest more okra. So it's, it's like, does it fit into a farm system or a home system? And just being aware that there is a difference as we're selecting. Um, and I really learned, like this is a picture of 60 different varieties that I was harvesting regularly. And by the end of the season, like it was kind of like almost baked into me where like I'd learned which plants were easy to harvest from and which ones weren't. And it, it some of them I was just like, it was, I was like, oh, phew, I've got to this one. And it would just be clip, 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 clip. And I'd have like five pounds of okra, no hassle at all. And then I'd go to the next variety and it would be one of these, it'd be like, 14 foot tall and I'd have to bend the whole thing down and like hold it in my teeth and, and it was like it was terrible there was um, a newspaper article written in the 1800s about a guy from Alabama that got so fed up with harvesting okra from tall plants that the newspaper article talked about him sitting in his rocking chair shooting okra pods off with a shotgun <laughs> I didn't get to that stage and I don't have a shotgun but um uh but I understood his frustration because it was just really annoying. Like it's, it took like 10 times as long to harvest half the amount of pods. Um, so just paying attention to those sorts of things I think are really important um, at the farm scale, less so at the garden scale. That's a great, great question actually. Yeah, so there's a practice called ratooning, um, pretty common in India, a little bit in Florida. You need a longer season than I have to do it effectively. But uh, you can harvest, you can grow okra early in the season, have it grow, produce kind of like a peak yield, and then come through and cut the whole plant just a few inches from the ground. And then when you're in like what actual peak okra season, prices tend to drop when there's high supply that, so that you don't get as much for your okra. And in that period, the okra isn't producing anything for you. So you take like a month off from harvesting okra but those stalks all re-sprout and grow again to a decent height, and then you get a fall harvest of okra. So you can kind of like split your harvest by hacking it down. Yeah, you'd get more lateral branching if you pinched off the top. Um, that that definitely happens and could be useful for the super tall varieties. Um, but in general, again, our length of season 
doesn't necessarily you don't necessarily get much better yields uh, so it would be more of a just a cultural practice if if you were like i don't like those tall varieties but if that was the case don't grow the tall varieties yeah um, so um so yeah yeah so you can manage a little bit with, with pruning um the other thing you can do that's really interesting is uh, the plants naturally keep growing and flowering, growing and flowering, growing and flowering, right? Indeterminate growth. Um, they shade out the lower leaves and the lower leaves senesce and drop off. Um, so what we've, th there's kind of like wasted energy in those lower leaves because they get shaded out and don't photosynthesize and finally die. So we've, there's one farmer, Nat Bradford in South Carolina that halfway through the season, when he's got decent top canopy, but the bottom leaves are still alive, takes a weed whacker at 90 degrees and goes down his rows and just like obliterates the lower three feet, all the leaves and branches, just everything comes off. And he, he's documented his harvest yields. He'll be having like an average yield of two, 300 pounds a week of okra. The week after he does that weed whacking, it spikes to like 600 pounds. So like the plant has this like traumatic response where it's like, oh my God, and actually, people have documented like an actual, um, I don't know, chemical compound that called traumatin, that actually the plant literally responds in that way to that abuse. This is not great. Uh, but but hy hyper produces a bunch of okra um, is, is its response. It's like it goes into like reproduction mode. It's like, oh my God, throws on a whole bunch of flowers, a whole bunch of okra, and he gets a real spike in yield. Uh, His variety gets to about six feet tall. Um, so once it's once it's up to a, a, like a five foot ish uh, maturity, he'll hack off the bottom ones and then get like this real big flush of okra. Yeah. That's a good question. I I haven't done a taste test on that. Um, I I don't know. I don't know. But I kind of want to now. Um. You probably all know this one, but it's worth just quickly saying. Um, so some new growers to okra um, will harvest the okra when it's really big, basically. They're, they're like, oh my gosh, it's the biggest okra in the field. It's going to be great. And then they take it home, and it's terrible. Um, because over time, okra pods develop woody fibers. That, that's what it comes down to. Um, now. A lot of people think that the size of the okra determines those woody fibers, and that's not actually true. It's time that determines those fibers. Now, time has a correlation with size, but there's other things that determine size, and that's temperature and water. So basically, you could have an okra plant growing. In week one, it's really hot. You've had a lot of rain, or your irrigation is running great, and um, the okra Will, under those conditions will grow really fast. Like you'll get really big pods really quickly. And if you, that could mean that you could harvest an eight inch pod that's deliciously tender because it got to eight inches in five days before five is produced. The very next week, we could have cool nighttime temperatures and no rain, so it's dry and cold. The okra grows really slowly. You could still harvest a five, a five day pod, but it might only be three inches long. So if you remembered your eight inch delicious pod from last week and were like, oh, this variety is awesome. I can harvest eight inch pods because it's being cool and dry. Your eight inch pods have probably been growing for 10 days and will be totally fibrous and terrible. So that's, that's like just a misconception that it's about you, all the seed packets will say harvest at four inches, harvest at this. It's, it's time, not size. So you got to, towards the end of the season, when it starts cooling off, you have to harvest your okra smaller because it's just not growing as fast. So that's, that's important. And then this is just a simple snap trick. Like if, if the tip breaks off, you just get your okra and break off the tip, it's tender. If it splinters, it's woody. And that's like, that's the fail safe trick. Um, and then when you're cutting it in the kitchen, you can also kind of hear it. Well, I'm going to circle back to this when we get to the food stuff, because um, there's some Cool things to cover there as well. Ants, uh, there's extra floral nectaries on okra, and the ants do like that. They don't actually eat the okra, but they gather on the flower. Um, 
yeah, if you had enough ants kicking around on a plant, they could cause damage. I've, I've not experienced that myself, uh, but it's certainly possible. Say again? Control ants. Um, I, I don't know. Um, more birds? OK. As a general control. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. I don't want any Missouri ants. <laughs> The main issue I have with ants is that they farm the aphids and then the aphids cause the damage. Okay. I've not noticed direct ant damage, but that's good to know. Good question and good timing. Th th this is this is seed saving. So um, I just, just wanted to reference a few quick things and I'll talk about longevity of the seeds as well. Um, just if you're interested in seeds. Now, obviously, my last presentation, um, in terms of seed diversity, then that's that's a path, and you can ignore a lot of these rules with that path. Um, but uh, you should know that okra flowers are self-pollinating, so they have both male and female parts in the same flower, so they can self-pollinate. But they're also big and beautiful flowers, so they definitely attract a whole bunch of pollinator activity. There's an East Coast native bee that sometimes gets called the okra bee because it's specialized at pollinating malvaceae crops. Um, so definitely, you know, you can see 10 to 30 percent, if not more, outcrossing in okra, even though it's capable of self-pollinating. Uh, so that tends to lead most, most guides you see about a, an eighth of a mile, maybe to a quarter of a mile isolation distance on okra. So that's the space you need between two varieties so that you can be sure they won't cross-pollinate. Um, so that means I can keep my Clemson spineless and my red burgundy pure um, by having that distance. Uh, I've got a picture on the next slide about bagging the flowers, which I want to show you, because uh, I think it's really easy with okra. Um, you need to know that the, the botanical maturity and the market maturity of okra is very different. I think that's probably obvious, but we eat okra when it's young and green, but the seeds aren't mature until it's like this picture, like fully brown and woody. Uh, generally, that takes about 40 days from flowering. So the flower opens, okra flowers only live for a day, generally self-pollinates, sometimes outcrosses, flower dies, hopefully the ovary has been fertilized and grows into an okra pod. And then from that day of flowering, about 40 days can lead to mature seeds. Interestingly, that generally 40 days is generally earlier than a fully dried pod. So you can harvest pods that are still somewhat green and get viable seeds off them if you then dry them down indoors. So if you're at the end of the season and you're worried about a frost and you know you've had about a month and a half of those pods on the plant, even if they're not fully brown, you can still sniff and bring them in and get mature seeds. So that's, that's a good thing for our shorter seasons. Um, and then on a small scale, then hand shelling okra is easy, uh, either if you're on your own, a good Netflix movie, you know, you'll be, you'll be there. You can do a lot of okra uh, while binge watching uh, or in community, okra is really fun to do because it's kind of got a musical notes to it. If everyone's got their own uh, plastic buckets or metal pans and a big amount of okra in the middle and everyone's shelling their okra, then we've done lots of community seed saving circles like that, which is really fun. I, I want to show you this because I think that's not what I thought I was going to show you, but it's also cool. Um, this is this is random tangent. What one is? Can anyone tell me what's wrong with that flower? I say wrong. Different about that flower. Too many petals. Okra flowers are described as pentamerous. Five, five petals. Um, that one's got seven. No, it's not. It's got eight. What happened? Yeah. It was. I have no idea what's going on here. Um, l last year I grew a variety that I've grown for a long time. And it started throwing out six-petaled, seven-petaled, eight-petaled flowers. I have definitely saved seeds 
from these. And I'm going to plant them out to see if that was an inheritable trait. But that kind of like breaks the botany of okra. Because like, you know, all of the taxonomical system is based on the floral structure. And so a Malvaceae is a five petaled plant family. And I have okra <laughs> that has eight petals. I don't know why. So it's not reading the textbook. You're right. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the, but the flower was stunning. Like I, I, I don't count my okra petals generally, but I was just walking down the field and saw this, and I was just like, oh my god, that's amazing. And then I was like, but it's wrong. Um, uh, and then this one on the right is a variety called La Hague, which came out of Burkina Faso from the USDA, and um, and it's like no okra I've ever seen. The plant itself had the like okra is like a semi erect. Um, annual that grows on, on these stalks. And this one had like wavy arms going out like a vine. Um, I, I suspect it's not the same species and it's something random, but I can't find any supporting anything about it. I don't know what it is. Um, it's kind of tasty. We call it dinosaur okra because it's got the, um, the stegosaurus um, edges to it. But anyway, so just, I, I, I don't know why I put those two in there apart from I find them fascinating and thought you might too. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good, good question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we we sometimes take on seed contracts with seed companies, in which case, like we grow a whole row of a variety in isolation, and everything's intended for seed. So that's one thing we do. Uh, and then in our kind of mixed variety plantings, we I, usually the first week of August for me, because that gives me like a comfortable window before that first frost. In that first week of August, I will do this practice here, which is going through and bagging flowers. And that'll be my seed stock. So generally, I will decide which plants I want to save seeds from for whatever qualities I like, and then save seeds. And then everything that grows after that, I'll still continue to harvest. So I'll, I'll still harvest to the frost, but I'll have one or two pods on that plant that are my seed stock. Um, good question. Did you hear that question at the back? Um, so uh, question was, is there a benefit from saving seeds early in the season versus late in the season? Um, we can talk more about this later, but my, my, my quick answer would be genetic, purely genetically, no difference. Like the, the maternal genetics of the plants are the same throughout. They don't change. Um, what might change is the epigenetic response. Like, so if there's a midsummer epigenetic response to high humidity, then that won't be present early in the season, but it will be present later in the season. So that's, and, and there is plenty of evidence of epigenetic inheritance. So that would be an advantage for saving later in the season. Uh, th for me personally, the, the advantage of waiting as long as possible to make those selections is that you've had more chance to observe the plant itself. So it's less about the epigenetic response and it's more, if I select early in the season, I don't know if it's got late season cold tolerance. I don't know if it's got um, downy mildew resistance because it's not moved in yet, Like right? So that's, that's the main reason I wait as long as possible. So I got more data to make my selection on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's not a solid reason why you'd be seeing a decline in quality from saving a late versus an early plant. 
very quickly, and then I'm going to clamp down on questions and keep moving forward. Um, not not quite, and that's that's what this is about. So I'll I'll talk through this one, and then I think it'll become clear what my process is. So so when I do these big variety trials um, or grow lots of different okra all together, uh, because I don't have the space to separate ten different varieties by a, an eighth of a mile, so I grow them all together. But I still want to save pure seed to maintain genetics on each of these varieties. So the the good thing with okra is it is a self pollinating flower, so it makes it so, so easy to save pure seeds from those plants, even if they're right next door to a different plant. So I've got Clemson Spinus here, I've got Red Burgundy here, very high chance that they'll outcross in the field. But what I can do is keep an eye on those plants. And as long as I put one of these little bags over a flower bud before it's opened, if I catch it in time, like a day or two before that flower bud opens, you see them swelling. They get a little bit yellow on the end. You put this bag over the top. The flower opens inside the bag, totally capable of self-pollinating. No insects can get involved, so I know there's no chance of cross-pollination. And basically, it just self-pollinates inside the bag. And then um, we know that flowers only live for a day. So the next day after flowering, I come and take the bag off and tie a little ribbon around the, the base, the peduncle of the okra. And that becomes my pure seed stock. So that pod there will definitely be Clemson spineless, even if it's surrounded by all these different varieties real close by. And I do that for all my varieties, and I do you know, make those selections, do two or three pods on the plants that I want. Two or three pods will give like 500 plus seeds, so plenty of seeds to grow myself and to share with very little work. We're talking about like bag on, next day, bag off ribbon, less than 60 seconds of work to maintain pure seeds on that pod. So I've done that for like th those 85 varieties we saw in the last presentation, we saved pure seed of every single variety. And it, w it was an afternoon's worth of work. It wasn't crazy. Uh, so real, real easy to do on okra because it's self-pollinating. Harder to do on plants that aren't self-pollinating like squash, because then you have to hand pollinate. But okra is self-pollinating, so you don't have to worry about that at all. Uh, and that's what this picture is here. You can see all, these are all the different seed varieties and all these orange tags and pink tags are all the, the seed crops on those varieties. So seed saving can be really easy on okra and that's how we manage lots of varieties in one space. We don't have to relocate them or anything like that. It's yeah. Yeah, th this is classic seed preservation. It's, um, I would say we do both. So we preserve genetics because some of those varieties have beautiful histories or deep connections with people and, um, and all the good stuff that we know about heirloom seed preservation, and that's important. Uh, but I think we also need high adaptive capacity plant populations with mixed genetics. Both can be true. We don't need to have a fight about it. Um, so we, we definitely do both. We do variety preservation uh, because we think that's important and, and seed companies want that. Uh, but we do the mixed genetics for, for resilience reasons. So, And you, yeah, you can do both. In fact, you can do both in the same population. Like all the, all the pods that didn't get bagged in that mixed planting will intercross. And you can save them. And that can be your adaptive population. So yeah, you can definitely, definitely do both. OK. A um, few slides on varieties, and I just want to—I want to make sure we get to the food section, okay? Um, so this is—we uh, did a random red variety trial where there was just a whole bunch of red varieties floating around, and we wanted to see what they were all like. Um, the the interesting thing here is that there's this variety in the top left, which obviously isn't red. That one was called Red Wonder. It's always always disappointed me. I, won I wonder if it was called Red Wonder because it wasn't red. Like, where did that name come from? Or was it just somebody mixed up the seeds and I got the wrong seeds? I don't know, but it's always been a curiosity for me. Um, uh, but yeah, lots of beautiful red varieties. And then my personal fascination is with these green pods with red blushing. I really like that phenotype. 
Um, so that's a bunch of varieties that I'll just leave there. We're going to come back to a couple of them. You, you, uh, there's nuanced taste differences. Yeah. Um, this is, uh, we saw this one in the last presentation. This is uh, 60 varieties of, of okra, um, which again, just, I like showing this picture because it just, it shows that there's more than just one green. There's more than Clemson spineless out there. Everyone grows Clemson spineless. It's an okay variety. It's not the best variety. Why do we have this level of diversity that exists? And yet everyone grows one or two varieties. So just trying to open people's eyes to exploring different okras. And then personally, um, this is a variety I got out of the USDA called Puerto Rican Evergreen. That was in one of my first trials. Um, really high yielding, early producing, did really well in our taste tests. So like beautiful plant, single stalk, like did all the right things. So I really liked this variety. Uh, but you can see there was an inherent diversity here. And this is a case where I, I didn't want all that diversity because it had all the deep ridge pods and that kind of thing. What I wanted was this really round pod. This is the one that I really, really liked. So over four or five years, I just saved seeds from the ones that produce round pods. And this is a picture taken last year where this is, we renamed it slightly because it had changed from that original population to Puerto Rican Ever Blush. And still diversity within this population, but I've stabilized that round pod feel. It's got velvetiness to it, and then that green with red blushing, and it's still real delicious. We, we have people tasting it, chefs tasting it, that describe this as having a sweet pea-like flavor, because it's, it's really, really good. Quick question in the back. Yeah. Uh, no, that was, so that was six. I, I, from the USDA, I grew out six plants and got that diversity from that one variety. And then I made my own selections for the pods that I wanted. Um, not necessarily, no. no. It's, oh, I don't think it does matter. I just love it. Like, I just, oh no, I just, I, I like those round pods. There's no actual reason, I'm just like. <laughs> In terms of like agronomics or even culinary, I mean, I mean, you could argue that you, you could fit more into a pickling jar. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, don't question my love interests. Um, no, I just, I just saw this part and was just like, that is a beautiful part, and I, that's what I want, uh, and so that's what I selected for. Um, and it, it tastes really good, and it does have good agronomic traits, but I wouldn't say round pods are better or worse than ridge pods. Um, for example, here's a ridge pod that I also like, so you know I'm very open. Um, uh, th this is one of my, um, this is a red variety that is one of our better tasting varieties, also productive, always really enjoyed it. It's got like a real deep red color to it in the whole plant, so the stem, petioles, uh, leaf veins, and, and the pods. Um, and so what we decided to do was, again, I maintain Puerto Rican Everblush as a variety. I maintain Aunt Hetty's Red as a variety. I think they're both great individual varieties. But we, we did a biparental cross. So before we were talking about these big open chaotic crosses, you can also just take one variety that you really like, manually cross it with another variety that you really like, and hope like good plus good equals better is the plan. Um, and this is the progeny of that cross. So these are the children of Puerto Rican Everblush and, and Hedy's Red in the third, po third population after the cross. So we, we made the cross, we saved the seeds and grew them out, saved the seeds and grew them out, saved the seeds and grew them out. And this is where we're at with number three. And what I'm hunt hunting for is a Puerto Rican Everblush-like pod in terms of the velvetiness, the flavor, the production, and the roundness, but with a solid red coloration. So I'm looking for This one has taken them, which that's the type of pod that I want to pull out of the population. But these seeds are available, this F3 population, where there's a lot of diversity still, are available through the experimental farm network. And so we're inviting people to go and buy a packet of these seeds. And we're back to what I was talking about in the first presentation, which is I, I want that red pod, but you may want something completely different. And this kind of diverse genetic base allows you all to select from two really good varieties that are being crossed you can pull out whatever genetics you want. You can maintain it as diversity. You could go, yeah, you could go out wherever. So we're very keen on like pushing out that genetic diversity. 
Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot about that. Um, my bad. Um, so textbooks say about five years uh, for okra seeds. You're looking about five years longevity. If you can keep them cool, dark, and dry, then you could pretty easily get five to ten years. And then if they're really dry, you can freeze them, and then you can get ten plus years. Uh, but just standard, you know, stable temperature conditions, maybe seventy Fahrenheit, somewhere dark and dry. You could be getting five years without too much hassle. You, you will see declining germination over time. So it's rarely good or bad. It's more like my germination rate is 90% in year one, and then maybe it goes to 85. And at some point, it drops off. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Generally, you see loss of vigor over time. Germination and vigor will drop over time. Those ones were planted in isolation, so I didn't bag them. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so p plant breeding, um, it's like the basically the first generation, second generation, third generation. It's the filial generation, um, F1, F. But yeah, the no, it's just like how far away from the original cross you've got. Uh, we saw this one this morning. This is just the. Um, the ultra cross field again, so I'm, I'm not going to re talk about this. Um, but th this is the 85 varieties plus related species that turned into like just seed anarchy in, in a fun and exciting way, but not a particularly useful way. So I, I can talk more about the okra ultra cross. These seeds are actually out there as well. If you want, some people might want to explore this diversity, certainly northern climates like the genetics. If, if you want to be successful on the margins of okra growing in Alaska, maybe. Um, then th this would be the population that would get you closest to the most success. Yeah. Um, no. Well, I have grown in greenhouses, but not okra. Yeah. Uh, it's. I feel greenhouse is like prime real estate, and okra doesn't need it. But you know, further north, that that would not be the case. Okay. The last. The last kind of. Um, Variety thing I want to show you before jumping into the food stuff is this one. Um, so so far, and what is probably all of your experiences growing okra, we've been talking about Abelmotius esculentus. So that's the Latin binomial, the species designation for what we all call okra. And 99% of the okra available in the United States is Abelmotius esculentus. And when I began growing okra, I didn't even know that there were other options. But there's a related species called Abelmotius cali, which is called West African okra. And when you look at uh, countries in West Africa, then production is about 50-50 split between Abelmotius esculentus and Abelmotius cali. So this is in some like sub okra off to one side. It's like a major part of the food crop. People just don't differentiate it botanically. It's just like different types of okra, but it's technically a different species. Then a friend of ours, John Jackson, um, had some seeds sent over from where his mother grew up in Liberia. Um, and so he calls it motherland okra. But when he grew it out the first year and sent me seeds, um, and then sent me seeds, showed me a picture of the pods, then I was like, John, I don't think that's Abelmotius esculentus. I think you've ended up with something else. And when we looked at the flower structure, it turned out it was Abelmotius cali. And this is one of four varieties of Abelmotius cali that I know that exists in the United States. So very, very small amount, but he's distributed it widely. It's interesting because it's just got slight differences. It's a little bit more drought tolerant than our standard okra. It grows big leaves that don't have any spines on them. So they have a strong culinary use that we're about to jump into. Um, these plants tend to get really tall and they produce later in the season. So like as okra is beginning to peter out, this one's really hitting its peak. So it can kind of work well with an Esculentus Cali interplanting. So I kind of like showing this just as like a public service announcement because nobody knows about West African okra um, as a, it's even an option. And most of the time when you see it listed in seed catalogs, it's listed as Abelmotius Esculentus. It's mislabeled um, because people just don't know. Uh, but it's a beautiful plant, big leaves, um, slightly ovoid pods, a little bit more of a meaty flavor to them, uh, but really, really great option in the garden. So I'd encourage you to seek out um, a little bit of species diversity in your okra planting. 
that's the, the actual the botanical defining feature are these um Uh, there's more of them and they're very, very narrow. They're about a millimeter to three millimeters wide. In Cali, they are, there's fewer of them and they're wider. So that, that's the main defining feature botanically. Um, okay, so food. This, the desirability of cultivating multiple purpose crops cannot be overemphasized, for crops that can produce several kinds of useful products make efficient use of land. The pressure imposed by expanding populations and higher standards of living will force us to produce food, feed, forage, fiber, foliage, and fuel on increasingly limited land resources. This was a publication put out in the 70s by this researcher. He's talking about okra. Um, as an answer to this, it's kind of like the subtext of this book is a seed to stem celebration. Like it's, it's the whole okra. And that was, as I was like trying to get ammunition against all these okra haters, I basically was just reading more and more and researching more and more and going down this rabbit hole. And it wasn't hard to find this information. I haven't created any of this information. It just doesn't seem to be well represented that like the whole plant is edible and or useful on some level. Uh, and it's a real powerhouse in this kind of like using the whole plant seed to stem mentality of, of gardening. So what we're going to do, I, I have not enough time, um, but we're going to like go through some of the highlights of all these different things. Um, okay, I'm not going to spend much time on the pods because it's, it's the easiest one, but I do want to say dried okra is really, really good traditional African culture behind here, but I dehydrate so much okra and then it rehydrates into soups and stews all winter long. And it's, it like concentrates the flavors. Two pounds of fresh okra goes down to about four ounces of dried okra and you're mainly losing moisture. So everything's just concentrated down. You can actually dry it down with oil and spices and it becomes like an instant snack or you can have it unspiced and then add it to your winter dishes. Um, the, the seed is a real good food component. We have chefs that are taking the immature seeds. So that's when the pods have just gone a little bit fibrous that you wouldn't want to use them as a whole pod, but haven't gone all the way through to full maturity. Well, you don't eat the pods, but you can eat the seeds. Uh, we've had people doing like okra caviar dishes where they marinate those seeds in. They've got like a real delightful pop to them. Uh, this is a chef, Clark Barlow, making a like an Israeli couscous type dish. Um, Drying the pods and grinding them is a traditional preparation. And then you end up with this like pod thickener. So you can use it, it, it adds flavor, nutrition, and a thickening agent. So like if I put too much water in my lentils, I'll add a tablespoon of okra powder and it'll thicken it right up. Um, that's the whole pod, the whole pod, yeah. This is okra marshmallows where we've taken the whole pod, the whole green pod, blended it up, added some vanilla, some honey, laid it out on dehydration sheets and just dried the whole thing down until it goes tacky. So this is kind of like fruit leather and then rolled it up and cut it and you get this delicious gumminess. And anybody that says they're an okra hater, give them one of these. See what they say. Um, and then the other pod thing is um, okra kimchi. This is, there's a recipe for this in the book. Okra kimchi is something that still makes me like salivate years after this guy made it for me. But uh, he takes the whole pods and rolls them in salt to start that sweating process and then mixes it with a cheap paste, lets it ferment for a couple of weeks and you get like the crunchiness of the raw okra, the sourness of the ferment, the spiciness of the cheap paste. It's really quite amazing. Okay, but what I really wanna focus on, there's so many different pod preparations that we could just do a whole presentation on that. I want you to know that the leaves are edible and protein dense and instead of weed whacking them all off, you could harvest them and eat them. Um, they that April Moshe's Cali, West African okra has smooth leaves, so you can use them, but when you cook it down, any spines go away. So it doesn't matter how spiny the leaves are, once you've cooked them, they're very edible. Um, we've put them into like Ghanaian dishes like Nkantomari, which is like a tomato-based uh, leafy greens dish, um, and put them into like Indonesian curry with coconut cream and tilapia and that type of thing. There's, there's lots of different ways to use the greens, but as a summer green, they're very nutrient dense and prolific. Uh, 
it does work as a microgreen if you get it before the true leaves come out. The cotyledons don't have any spines. They're kind of like sunflower microgreens, if that's um, something you do. Um, and the red stem is kind of pretty, so chefs like it. We've had chefs use them like just kale chips. So they'll take the younger leaves and just fry them. Here's a dish that won a, a big award where you can see lots of different okra preparations. We have the immature okra caviar example down with the little white seeds. We have the charred okra pods, but we also have the little leaves, our okra leaves that are just being deep fried. So crunchy, delicious. I guess you can deep fry anything. Um, I wanted to throw this one in here because I think it's interesting. Um, when you harvest the leaves, you can harvest the whole petiole. And then the petiole, some varieties have hollow petioles. And then you can cut them into six inch lengths and dehydrate them. And then they make straws. Um, and they're obviously decompostable straws. But the really cool thing about it, this is like a business model that's not taken off. Where, um, where you dry them down. When you start drinking from them, then they rehydrate slightly and they get a little bit of that sliminess back. So that, that mucilage actually has antibacterial properties. And so these could be marketed as shareable straws. <laughs> it's not taken off yet. Um, so the, the okra flowers, also edible. I love taking people into the field and making them eat an okra flower because they're kind of intimidating. Um, and I think you can learn a lot from somebody by how they eat the flower, like delicately eating a petal at a time or just munching the whole thing or not even picking it off the plant. Just um, so <laughs> the thing with the okra flowers that we already talked about with seed saving is they don't last very long. So they make it a little hard as an edible flower because they go to mush within a couple of days. The main way you see these being used is like big Chinese culture in uh, okra flower teas. So mainly that's the way I've been using them. I, I harvest them, I dry them. Maybe it's right before frost and you have lots of okra flowers that will never become pods. You can harvest all those flowers and dry them. Maybe you're gonna go away for a week's vacation in summer and you don't wanna come back to a billion woody pods. So you strip the entire plants of all the flowers and dry them. And then you're kind of resetting the clock on the okra. But either way, um, the okra flowers have kind of, um, there's a lot of like hibiscus tea, Malvasia tea type properties that makes it a, a good winter tea. Uh, so that's generally what we, we've done with them. Uh, experiment wise, we've soaked them in vinegar to make an okra flower vinegar, which it turns it red, which was interesting. So once I learned that, I soaked it in vodka and got a red okra flower vodka that I was, thought was cool. And then as soon as you have a red okra flower vodka, you're kind of compelled to make a Bloody Mary with that vodka. And then you've got your okra pickle on your okra flower vodka Bloody Mary, and you're drinking it with an okra petiole straw. So what can I say? Um, and then the last section here, which I actually think is like one of the exciting, most exciting things for okra as a multi-purpose crop is the seeds. The mature seeds have a macronutritional profile similar to soybeans, so good oil production, good carbohydrates, good protein. Uh, you can roast them and dry them down and they take on a coffee-like flavor and use that. We've had people put it in pie crusts and savory muffins and bring out a real nuttiness from that flour. Uh, you can also use it as a non-roasted flour, so kind of a suedo grain mentality. And then bakers have made sourdough bread with it, um, kind of like a biofortification component where bringing in 20% okra flour to a wheat flour really increases the nutritional profile. That's a savory muffin. And you get the little dark flecks of the okra seed in that muffin. Um, and yeah, nut nuttiness is the best way to describe that. We may, I, I, I took an acorn flour recipe and just put in okra, roasted okra seed flour instead of acorn flour and came up with these pancakes, which again, they're really dip, rich, dark, nutty. They're, they're the type of flavors that come out. And then this is like the, the exciting, the, the current exciting project is Okra produces a, a delicious edible oil. Uh, it could be the olive oil of the South, but um, it's got a high, it's got a low amount of okra seed oil in each seed. So it's a limiting factor to pressing it. So the product is good, but it doesn't produce enough. So this is another one of our side breeding projects where we found the highest producing oil cultivars at about 20%. We've made crosses between them all. 
we've partnered with the Princeton Seed Farm to grow out all these uh, different children of that cross. And then their chemistry department is analyzing them all for seed content. So making selections, but not selections that you can see, selections that you have to run through a fancy machine to find out. So that's why we had to partner with the university. But hopefully in a few years, we'll have a, an okra seed oil variety that would be more 30, 35% okra seed content, which would be viable to put large amounts of southern acreage into okra production for grain production, much lower inputs required for okra versus the other commodity crops. So high potential for environmental impact by growing a thousand acres of okra versus a thousand acres of corn, soy, wheat. Uh, yeah, it would work, the byproduct would work for silage as well. Um, so I, I hope you can kind of see like, I, I, we can work on all scales and I think we need to work on all scales to solve all these problems. Um, and that's one side product. Um, we've grown oyster mushrooms on the spent pods. So when you do a lot of seed saving, you end up with all those pods. They either make good fire starter or you can pasteurize and inoculate them with oysters uh, and they grow quite well. I usually do mixed medium, but it does work just on straight, on straight okra pods. Um, and then the fiber. So the okra malvaceae has a fiber, a bast fiber that runs just under its bark. You can go through a process to pull that fiber off like you would for flax or hemp or anything like that. And then this isn't my speciality, but we've worked with local folks that have run it through a spinning wheel and come up with an okra skein. And then the next step is to run it through a loom. And then we have okra fiber textiles, which I'm excited about, but we haven't quite got there yet. On a lower scale, you know, I've made cordage with the okra fiber and it's beautiful and strong. Actually in studies, it has the same tensile strength as hemp. So we could be growing and eating okra all year and at the end of the season have a viable fiber product instead of just growing a single fiber product. That's back to that original quote. Can we grow food and fiber at the same time? Okra says yes. This is a, just a small paper making experiment we did with okra with the fiber and actually using the root mucilage as a, as a, a, a binding agent in that paper. That's, that's the root that we use. So we just threw that in with a whole mix and kind of loops it all together. Okay, this, this is nearing the end here. Um, so, <laughs> what to say about this? Um, I came across all sorts of things when I was researching okra. One of them was a Zimbabwean tradition of using the okra pods as a moisturizer, uh, which makes sense with okra, you know, like that it's very hydrating, both if we consume it internally, but in this case, using it externally. So I just followed their instructions and kind of like boiled the pods for five minutes, blended them up, persuaded my wife to slather it over her face. The okra slices on the eyes, that was all me. I'm, I'm proud of that. Um, and then I also persuaded my three-year-old to do it too. She, she, um, she smiled for the photograph and then ran off. So she, she didn't stay for long, but my wife stayed for five minutes and said that her skin felt fantastic. And then if you look a little bit deeper, then okra has shown up in plenty of like soap making, cosmetics and hair products over the years. Uh, and certainly has potential in more industrial landscapes as well. Um, and then I like finishing with this, this quote that a, a single finger can't eat okra. And I fully believe that everything we do needs to be in, in community. And that's how we get to places quicker. Um, so that's me. Um, oh, I did I, one thing I want to mention, and I know I've gone over time. I, I flew here, so I, did, I couldn't bring any books. Um, but if people are interested in this book, one, I can pass this around and people can just look at it. Um, this is cut off slightly, but this is, um, the Utopian Seed Project runs a, a website called Crop Stories, where we sell like magazines of single crop specific stuff. And this book is listed on there. So I, I run that. So if, if you were to, you can buy the book anywhere you want, but if you were to buy it from cropstories.com, then that comes to me. And so I'll be able to sign the book and send it out to you. And then that income supports me a little bit and the Utopian Sea Project quite a lot. Um, so if you're interested in buying the book, then there's that, but it's available elsewhere as well. Um, and then I think I've got that obligatory thing and I'll stop there. Thank you so much.